Welcome Year 9 to your second summer webinar, this one focusing on the Holocaust, the period 1933 to 1945. Uh, this webinar is going to break down to several key sections. So firstly, we're going to do a brief overview of the history of anti-Semitism and a very brief discussion on the nature of the Holocaust, particularly looking at the victims. Then we're going to move on to looking at specifically Jewish life in Germany and in wider Europe, broken down into three sections. So firstly, 1933 to 1938, then 1939 to 1941, and then finally 1941 to 1945. We're then going to just have a discussion on the end of the Holocaust and sort of liberation and the Nuremberg trials, and then finish with a reflection on the significance of the Holocaust. Uh, before we do that, though, just want to run through some of the key words we're going to be using throughout this webinar. So firstly, we have anti-Semitism, which is hostility or prejudice towards Jewish people, Jewish society. So really important, anything anti-Jewish is anti-Semitic. Uh, then we have the ghettos, which is an enclosed district, uh, which is designed to isolate a community in a town or city, this case specifically uh, Jewish people. We then have genocide, which is the deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of a particular nation or ethnic group. We then have segregation, which is an enforced separation of different racial groups in a country, community or specific area. Now, the Holocaust has lots of different definitions and depending on where you come from, depending on your point of view, there are sort of variations on a theme. I personally uh, prefer using the definition given by the Imperial War Museum, which is the Holocaust was a systematic murder of the European Jews by the Nazis and their collaborators during the Second World War. For the first time in history, industrial methods were used for the mass extermination of a whole people. Uh, but there are slight variations on that you might find on the internet if you search it. Uh, then we've got concentration camps, which were camps created initially to hold political prisoners of the Nazis and later used to collect Jewish people before they were transported to death camps. We then have death camps, which are camps specifically designed for the purpose of killing during the Holocaust. And then finally, we have the final solution, which consists of gassing, shooting, random acts of terror, disease and starvation that counted the death of six million Jews. Um, it's important also to remember uh, the term final solution was created during the war to describe what was going on, whereas Holocaust was created after the war as a definition for the whole period. So the, the final solution focuses on a very specific period of the Holocaust, whereas the Holocaust is the whole overarching part. Um, so just sort of to put things in context, unfortunately, anti-Semitism is not uh, a unique thing to Germany in the Nazi period and not, and not a unique thing to history. It has been a problem for Jewish population for a long time, as we can see here, and not just in one place, but across the world as well. I just want to highlight some of the ones that are uh, in bold just to sort of discuss and go through those. So England itself in 1290, among other times, did expel its entire Jewish population. So even England has had periods of anti-Semitism in its history. Uh, the Black Death particularly was a very difficult time for Jewish populations because of a lack of understanding of what the Black Death was at the time. Many people across Europe blamed Jewish people for it and attacked them and killed them in large groups known as massacres. Uh, Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Church, which of course is the basis of the Church of England today, he was very anti-Semitic. He really did not like Jewish people. And even uh, the popes have written rules for Jewish people in Rome and in the Vatican for restricting what they can and cannot do. And again, that's not unique to the pope. Lots of countries had very strict rules well into the 20th century about what Jewish people could and could not do in their countries. So though the Holocaust itself is, is unique and is a one-off um, point of history, anti-Semitism as a problem has unfortunately continued and is still a problem to this day. Uh, the other key thing to remember about the Holocaust, this will focus very much on the Jewish experience as they were the biggest victims of the Holocaust. So six million Jewish people died during the Holocaust. But it's important to remember that actually there were 10 million victims altogether. So there were 4 million other victims of the Holocaust, mainly coming from Eastern Europe, but from Germany as well and other places who were non-Jewish that were also affected. And the other really important thing to also consider with the victims, um, and it's very hard to sort of get across, is we talk in such large numbers that, of course, these are all individuals, they're all human beings it's all you know different stories and there is you know there's vast amounts of information on lots of different experiences 
throughout this and it's important to sort of remember as well while going through some while doing this that there's lots of different individual stories and it's not just big numbers and big swing statements so it's 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 difficult to sort of imagine that but also it's important to remember that every single one of these people were human and that that needs to be considered and you know a certain amount of respect and reverence needs to be shown as we go through this so first point we're going to talk about is the period of 1933 to 1938 so obviously hitler comes to power in 1933 and even before he came into power he is very very anti-semitic and doesn't try and hide it there's lots of references to it in the speeches and coming to power and lots of sorts of examples of him wanting something to happen to jewish population that said when he comes to power in 1933 he can't start just sort of getting rid of the jewish population because he doesn't have the support of the german people if you cast your minds back to the first webinar which looked at life in nazi germany Hitler had a very effective way of controlling the German population and brainwashing them into believing his ideas. But in 1933, he didn't have that. It takes a number of years before people are fully indoctrinated in Nazi ideas and sort of let him get away with what he's doing. So Hitler has to sort of do things slowly so as not to cause opposition to him. So in 1933, he starts off by doing very, very simple things. Though it's not on there, the first thing he did was ban Jewish people from sports clubs seems like a really really sort of mundane thing but the fact is that because he keeps doing these sorts of banning them from this banning them from that banning them from something else it gets german people used to the idea of jews being banned from things that on the surface doesn't seem to be bad but it, it sort of they then come to accept it and then by accepting it they're accepting nazi policies or accepting what is happening and that's a, a big reason why the holocaust happened the way it did was the Nazis manipulated the German population into accepting what they were doing was right and not questioning it. So 1933, we see um, books being burned, we see race studies being introduced into German schools, so again, trying to indoctrinate the German youth against Jewish people and Jewish teachers were sacked. Now, 1934, things escalate quite dramatically and are much more open. So first of all, there's a massive increase in anti-Jewish propaganda, but more importantly, very openly, Jewish shops are targeted by the Nazis and as we can see in the photograph at the top they are branded with the Star of David to show they are Jewish shops and there are German soldiers, there are Nazi officials outside these shops discouraging people from going in. They're not stopping them from going in but they're making it very very difficult which has a real impact on the business and of course it, that's people's livelihoods that are being affected. So even by 1934, one year after Hitler comes to power, Jewish people are starting to feel the impact of the Nazis and the fact that, they, that their livelihoods are being affected. Uh, then May 1935, they're banned from joining the army. And then September 1935, another really, really significant development was the Nuremberg Laws. Now, these laws are fundamentally important into the, to what happens later on. So, first of all, it, get, it bans Jews marrying anybody else. So if you are married to a Jewish person, that marriage is annulled, it never happened, and they can't happen again. They are also uh, not allowed to vote, they lose all those sorts of rights. So that's, that's on its own is very, very important in terms of losing those basic rights. So straight away by 1935, Jewish people are second class citizens. What the law also does, and this is where it's particularly dark, is identifies what is a Jewish person. So they, they create charts and tables and law that defines in law what a Jewish person is and it's that legal definition that's used later on then when they are removed from German society and ultimately killed. So it's a very, very dark day when the Nuremberg laws are introduced. Uh, 1936 during the uh, Olympics, anti-Semitism actually is sort of brushed under the carpet and hidden from the majority of the people while they are there, but it's still sort of going on in the background. And then things escalate. So by 19, uh, so 37, 38, we start seeing a real more, much more open attack on Jewish people. So Jewish businesses are now taken away from themselves. Um, Hitler continues to give speeches about being anti-Semitic. And then in November 1938, we have Crystal Nut, otherwise known as the Night of Broken Glass. And this is the first open attack across Germany on Jewish communities by German people. Now it's led by the Nazis, but everyday German people also get involved. So they attack Jewish homes, they attack Jewish shops, they attack uh, Jewish synagogues, and they destroy them. To make matters worse, Jewish people are blamed for it, 
And so 30,000 of them are arrested and sent to concentration camps, but also they're forced to pay billions of marks to repair the damage. So again, they're losing their money, they're losing their homes, and there's no chance of them rebuilding it. Jewish people are forced to change their names to make them much easier to identify. Jewish children are banned from schools, and we start seeing the development of having to wear the Star of David as well. So by 1938, Jewish people are pretty much separated from German society. They are no real rights. They can't really own property. They've been separated from society. And it's been accepted by the German population because they've been indoctrinated into believing what Hitler is doing is right. So then we have the next period of 1939 to 1941. 1939, of course, is when World War II begins, and so the situation really, really dramatically changes. Also in 1939, uh, Germany invades Poland. Now, pre-World War II, Poland has one of the largest Jewish populations in the world, and so the Nazis take that over. So they need to come up with a, a, a way of controlling this population. All the things we discussed previously, the changing of the names, the Star of David, that the laws banned them from everything, were introduced to all the countries in Europe that they took over. But on top of that, they started physically separating the populations into what are called ghettos. So areas of cities would be physically walled off, as we can see in one of the pictures, and the Jewish population would be forced into that area. It was normally a small part of the city. And it was nowhere near enough space for the entire Jewish population, and they'd all be forced into that area. As well as that, lots of German Jews were then taken out of Germany this time and moved into Poland and put into these ghettos as well. So inside these ghettos, we have these families forced basically to live in a room together. They lose all their space, all their time, all their property. Um, they don't really get much food into the um, ghettos. They don't really have much work. So again, the they're being forced into these very small environments where starvation is a real problem, disease is a real problem, and they're just left to their own devices and you know left to effectively die in some respects, but also to make their lives much, much worse. And again, they're doing this in Poland in really remote areas where people can't really see what's going on. So no one really knows at this point the true horror of what's going on. They hear rumours of what's going on, but with them separated into Poland, it's away from Western Europe, it's away from places like France and Britain who would be interested in what is going on. And then in 1941, we move sadly from this sort of ghetto experience to what is known as the final solution, whereby Hitler starts the systematic killing of Jewish people. The process starts, first of all, what's called deportation. So first of all, the, German, uh, the Jewish populations in European countries are concentrated in one area. So either if it's near a city, they'll be put into a ghetto. If it's in the countryside, they would be moved into the concentration camps. So once they've, once they've been gathered in those areas, they would then be put onto trains to take them to the death camps. Now, as we can see in these photographs, these trains were horrible. They were what are called cattle carts. They were designed to carry livestock from one place to another. So they are very, very simple uh, carriages with nothing in them at all, apart from a very small window and a bucket. And some of these journeys, if we look at the map, can take many, many, many days. So we've got down in Greece, we've got Italy, it can take four, five, even six days to travel that distance. They're not getting any food. They're not getting any sort of uh, sleep. They're forced to stand up the entire time. They have uh, weight, human waste everywhere. So unfortunately, lots of people are killed by this process, particularly from further away, by the simple fact of them just not being looked after and supported by the German people. So even before they get to the camps, there is really horrible conditions that they face. On arriving at the camps, things get even worse. So they get taken off the trains, and then they are so they are then broken up and selected. So though a family might arrive together, as they are escorted off the platform, the, the people are separated right and left. And one group are sent off into huts and camps, and another group is sent off into woods. And the Nazis are effectively choosing who is living and who is dying at this point. So when they come to them, they would be selecting people that they think might be useful for hard physical labor, will be sent one way, and then everybody else sent another way. As we see in the final picture, we see lots of women and children waiting in a woodland area. And this was designed as a trick, as a ruse, to try and sort of trick the Jewish people into thinking that things are going to be okay. So these people are reassured, they're given a little bit of food, they're told that it's going to be okay, 
and they're sort of gathered together and waiting, told them that also they're going to get a shower, they're going to get clean, they're going to get some uh, new clothes and bits and pieces. Unfortunately, that is not what happens. Once they are selected and gathered in these wooded areas, they are then taken into the gas chambers. And these gas chambers are designed to look like shower blocks, they're designed to look sort of non-threatening, but it becomes very apparent very, very quickly what the purpose is of these. So at Auschwitz and Birkenau, which is the largest concentration camp, they have several of these large gas chambers that could hold up to 2,000 people at a time, and they would herd these people into the gas chambers and then they would use gas to poison them until they are dead. And unfortunately, that isn't the end of it. Once they've been gassed, the bodies are then taken out and cremated, as we can see uh, in the cremation chambers. So in an attempt to sort of hide the evidence and destroy what is going on. And this is an ongoing process that happens all the time in these camps. And that's why in the definition uh, from the Imperial War Museum, we see it as a, an industrial process. This is a constant going on process and it's uh, obviously very horrible for everyone involved. Now, um, those that are not instantly selected for the gas chambers and to be killed are sent off to do physical hard labor and effectively uh, will build things, will make things, and will do things to the Nazis until they die from exposure and exhaustion. They're not really treated very well, they're not really given much shelter. And particularly the location of the camps in Poland in the winter, particularly, it's very, very, very cold. So they die from hypothermia and exposure. And in the summer, is very, very, very hot. So they can die of dehydration. They can die of uh, uh, sunstroke, things like that. So those conditions are just as bad. And they, they are forced to work physically very hard with the idea being that they will die eventually. So that's the, the, the plan. That's why it's called the final solution. The idea being trying to kill the Jewish population through different means. Now, as the war goes on, obviously the Nazis start losing, these camps start getting discovered. And the most famous one is 27th of January, 1945, when the Soviet army liberates Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. And to this day, that is known as International Holocaust Memorial Day. Now, once these camps start getting discovered and you know people start realizing what is going on, they start realizing that something needs to happen. So any Nazis they can find are arrested and captured, and they're put on trial in what is known as the Nuremberg War, type war Crime Trials. And lots and lots of people are sentenced to lifetime in prison, and some are even executed for their roles in the Holocaust, for planning it or being involved in it. And even to this day, it's important to remember that there are still people being tried for what happened during World War II. And even after World War II, there's a number of famous cases of people being captured and put on trial much later on, the most famous being um, Adolf Eichmann, who was captured by the Israelis in the 1970s and put on trial. He was probably the what's described as the architect of the Holocaust. He was captured in Argentina, taken back to Israel and put on trial for his role in it. And like I said, to this day, people are still being put on trial for what happened. Now, Obviously, the Holocaust is a very, very significant moment in history. And I think this monument and this particular sort of map really highlights just why it is so significant. So as we can see here, uh, this is a monument in the very, very north of Norway. OK, it's above the Arctic Circle. So in the winter, it's incredibly dark, incredibly cold. But yet during World War Two, 17 Jewish people were taken from their town here down to um, Auschwitz concentration camp to be killed. So this sort of monument reflects just how determined the Nazis were to destroy the Jewish population in Europe, but also why it's really important that to show that the Holocaust had such a, a, a wide effect on people and that nobody, no matter how far away they were from Germany, was still affected by it. And so it's really important to remember, obviously, all the victims that died, but also just the sort of the sheer scale of what happened in that period, particularly in 1941 to 1945. Uh, thank you, and that is the end of your webinar.